So uh, before I get started, fun note, that song is called Hocus Pocus, and it's by a band named Focus. And I didn't realize that was a really amazing pun for my talk until my girlfriend asked if I did it on purpose. <laughs> so anyway, we're here to talk about Houdini. And obviously the first question with Houdini is, well, what is Houdini? According to their wiki, uh, the objective of the CSS Tag Houdini Task Force, aka CSS Houdini, is to jointly develop features that explain the magic of styling and layout on the web. Practically, though, what does that mean? Well, it means being able to extend CSS via JavaScript so that authors, us, no longer have to wait decades uh, for standards bodies and browsers to bring new stuff into fruition. Now, you might say, wait, Sam, can't we do this already? We've got CSS next, we've got post CSS, we've got CSS and JavaScript, all this stuff. The answer is no, not really. It's currently not possible to actually extend CSS via JavaScript. It's only possible to write JavaScript that kind of mimics CSS with what we've got today. Actually polyfilling CSS or introducing new features like CSS Grid to a browser that doesn't have it is hard to do, if not impossible, without really affecting your user's performance in a negative way. What Houdini is going to let us do is actually tap in to the CSS render engine and allowing us to extend CSS and do so at the speeds of the CSS render engine. The way I like to think about it is much like how service workers are a low-level JavaScript API for the browser's cache, Houdini is introducing low-level JavaScript APIs for the browser's render engines. And that's pretty cool. So the first question I get when we do this is, can we use Houdini? And the answer, unequivocally, is no. You cannot use Houdini. Uh, this is not available today in browsers. Uh, Chrome just shipped kind of sort of paint, but it's not going to be able to do everything I'm showing you today. But that's OK. This is, think about this as like learning about CSS Grid or service workers five years ago. And you'll be on top of the ball when this actually starts to roll out to browsers. And because you can't use it today, I have a warning. This talk is all about stuff that's in progress. There are no real compatible implementations. One of my demos literally broke this morning because I made the mistake of updating Chrome Canary. In fact, all these things really only work in Chrome Canary. I've been talking about this for about a year, and I've had four or five incompatible API breaking changes in that amount of time. So this may not reflect the final syntax. Terms and conditions imply not redeemable for cash. Your mileage may vary. That being said, let's talk about it. So the first part, and the part that really is the underlying thing of Houdini, are worklets. Worklets are like itty-bitty web-ish workers. Worklets are extension points for render engines. They're like web workers, if you're familiar with them, but they work on a much smaller scope. Importantly, they can be parallelized. They live on multiple threads, and they uh, can get called by the render engine themselves. They're not something that we call. We're basically writing instructions for the render engine to use when they need it. Web workers, or sorry, worklets look a little bit something like this. We have our window object, and we have a worklet name, so demo worklet, and then we add a module with a path to our worklet. This will load our worklet in and get it ready for our render engine to use. Add module is a promise, so we can run them all through something like promise all, and we can then off of it, so once they're loaded, we can use it. And then we can do work once our worklets are available. This is important for some worklets, not so important for others. An actual worklet is a JavaScript file, it's like a function that has a worklet name, so register worklet demo worklet is an example of a worklet name. We provide the name of what we want to call the thing we're working on. This will make a little bit more sense when you start to see real examples. And then there's a class. Inside the class, all worklets have a process function. It's not necessarily called process. It might be called something else. But the process function is the important bit. It's a specially named uh, property on this class that is the thing the render engine is going to call. It might take arguments. It might not take arguments. It might return something. might work directly on something else. 
Kind of depends on what the workload is. Let's take a look at the life cycle, because this life cycle is a little bit different, and this is what really makes uh, worklets really powerful. So we have our render engine, our browser. It's going to spin up our main thread. This is the thing that JavaScript gets run on and Paint gets run on, all that sort of stuff. But in parallel to the main thread, our browser will spin up lots of worklet threads. These are a couple different. It might not necessarily be four, but it'll spin up a couple different worklet processes. From our main thread, we can have our browser JavaScript. And our browser JavaScript might call something like window.addModule, which will add our worklet. That worklet then will get spun up into two or more worklet processes. It's done so that we can ensure that our worklet isn't working off of some state that it doesn't or shouldn't have. Worklets are meant to be worked on in isolation and in parallel. Then when the render engine needs something that's run by a worklet, the render engine will call whatever that process function is, and it will execute that worklet for us. Worklets, like I said, are the underlying foundation for which all of Houdini is based. They're the magic that makes it happen. It's really the secret sauce of Houdini. The next big thing that Houdini is going to bring us is a typed OM. So the typed OM exposes a new data structure called a CSS style value designed to performantly manipulate our CSS values beyond just simple strings like we have now. It has a bunch of subvalues, subclasses. CSS keyword values, which are idents, things like grid or block or flex for the display property. They're position values, and they have x and y's. They're transform values in all the transform subclasses, like rotation, scale, et cetera. They're unit values, which are either bare numbers or numbers with units. And then they're math values, which are complex numbers, like uh, calc values and mins and maxes. So let's take a look at an example of what this looks like. So we have an example class, and it's got a background position of center, bottom, 10 pixels. Hopefully, that we can all kind of visualize how that background position is going to be placed. And then in JavaScript, we can grab our element and run this new function, computed style map. Computed style map brings back the typed OM representation of the styles for this element. So if we get the x part of the background position, we'll get a CSS unit value of 50 uh, and a unit of percentage, because center centers it. 50%. If we get the y value, we'll get a math uh, sum. It'll have an operator of sum, and it'll have an array of values that are being summed. The first one is negative 10, and the unit is pixels, because we're moving up from the bottom. And then the second one is 100%, uh, because we're going all the way down to the bottom. Typed OM, I really like to think of it as the glue that will meaningly, meaningfully uh, bring together our CSS and our worklets. Yeah, cool, but what can we do with this stuff? And the answer is, once we have worklets and once we have the type dome in place, we can do some pretty rad things. Part three, the cool custom stuff. Please let me introduce you to window.css. The first thing that we get with window.css our custom variables, or as we really need to start thinking about them, custom properties. And with the custom properties and values spec, we can actually make snozberries taste like snozberries. Here's our current situation today. I've got a custom property. It's called my color, and I set it to green. Then I set it again to URL, not a color. And URL isn't a color. So that's silly and sad, and it's not what we want. So when we go to use that uh, for our color, everything will be sad, and it won't know, and it'll be bad, and just terrible things happen. But then, window.css.register property. We're going to say we're going to register the my color property, and we're going to call it a color. Now it's definitely a color. The browser knows the type of this property is color, and we get all of the things we expect to be able to get with colors, including saying that URL isn't valid. There are a couple of different things we can do with register property. Besides name and syntax, we can decide whether or not our custom property inherit up, inherits up the DOM tree. 
and we can give it an initial value if we like. Syntax will default to letting everything in, uh, but we have lots of different options for syntax. So we have lengths and numbers and percentages. We've got length percentages, which are things like calc, colors, images, URLs, integers, angles, time resolution. Transform lists and custom idents. All the different building blocks we need to truly create custom properties are available built on top of this typed OM. We can also have different combinations of things. So we can either have a single type. We can have multiple types, like an image or a URL, by piping them together. We can have lots of different idents that we accept, like big, bigger, all caps, bigger. And we can have lists of things by adding a plus to the end. Live demos, they're fun. Hopefully this will work. So here is an example of something that you might see today. I've got a custom property, unregistered color, set it to coffee. I've got a linear gradient here. I'm using my custom property. And on hover, I want to change to this other custom property, or this other value. And when I do that, that's sad. That doesn't work. You can't, trans you can't transition colors in gradients. But if we move from our unregistered property to our registered property, all of a sudden, it works. We've been able, we can use registered properties to actually transition things like color because we've told the browser that this is a color, and browsers know how to transform colors and transition colors. If we put something invalid into this, like URL foo, it defaults to our default color because registered property, or sorry, registered color is a color, and URL isn't a color. It's a URL. In fact, if we go so far as to remove this entirely, it'll still work because we've registered this property with a default. So if it doesn't find it, it'll use whatever the default value is. And of course, it'll still transition. The second thing that Houdini implants, and we kind of can start using today, if you only care about Chrome and don't care about some of the other advantages of Houdini, is the CSS Paint. CSS Paint is cool because Bob Ross is cool, and everyone likes to paint with Bob Ross. But seriously, uh, Paint answers the question, have you ever wanted to use Canvas as a background, as a mask, or as a border in CSS with the styling and flexibility of an element and the scalability of an SVG. And your immediate answer to that question is probably, no, Sam, I've never wanted to do that. <laughs> but it's really cool, and I'm going to show you some uses for it. This is what the Paint API gives us. So let's look at the Paint API's worklet. We have a class of my paint. We have input properties. These input properties are the properties we want to get off of an element to use in our Paint worklet. We can also pass in arguments with the same syntax that we use for custom properties. We can decide if we want to allow alpha. And then the process function for the paint worklet is called paint. We have a drawing context, which is almost identical if you've ever used canvas drawing. We've got the size of the box being painted. We have the properties that are passed in, and we have the arguments that are passed in. So let's actually write one. Here is a simple paint worklet. We're going to register a paint called circle and we're going to bring in the circle color custom property. We're going to get that, set the cur circle color custom property as the color we want to fill with, do a little bit of math to draw a circle in the center, and then actually draw it with our context. Then window.css.paintworklet.addModule. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's pretty easy to write once you get a hang of it. JS slash circle JS. And what we get is we get a circle painted in the center of our box. We can make it larger, we can make it smaller, it grows, it shrinks as we work. Because we're using custom properties here, I can change the color of that circle by changing that custom property. We can do other neat things with this as well. We don't have to sim stick to simple geometry. We can draw things like faces. And because I'm fabulous at art, you'll see that it grows and shrinks, and we can have fun, goofy faces. 
And because, like I said, you can't really use this stuff yet, we can go so far as to draw warning signs in our elements to say, hey, hold on. Now, this is all fun, this is funky, this probably doesn't impress you much, but what really is cool about paint is we can start to use paint to polyfill some upcoming CSS specs. So there's a CSS spec for choosing how we want our corners to be shaped so they're not just squares. What we can do is we can do something like WebKit mask image, paint, corner shape, and we can mask this image with a drawing that we can control through CSS. So we don't have to create custom masks for each one of our boxes. We can use the Paint API to do that for us. And we can corner radius. Style that all with CSS. So we can have one paint worklet working to polyfill almost that whole spec down to shape, different shapes for the actual border radius or the actual corner shapes. And that gets a little bit cooler than just drawing warning signs in the background. OK, so worklets, typed OM, Paint API and custom properties and values, those are all fairly straightforward in Houdini's world anyway. The next two things, they get a little bit fuzzy, so you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. First thing we're going to talk about are, is the CSS animation API for Houdini, because yo, I heard you really like parallax. <laughs> right? So what the CSS Animation API with Houdini does is it lets us listen for user input, like scroll events, and then style elements based on that user input. And we do it all off the main thread because it works in a worker. This API will actually let us make things like parallax perform well and not just be terrible for our user experience. So let's take a look at the, animator work, or the animation worklet. We have a constructor. This is going to be called every time we create a new instance of our animation. And we have animate, which has current time and effects. What we're doing in the animation worklet is we're manipulating the timeline of an animation effect. So the current timeline is the time on our timeline. And the effect is an array of different things we're uh, working with. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to build Twitter's little header animation, where we have a big scrolling area and an invisible header and an avatar and some other stuff. And as we scroll, our header is going to fade in, and our avatar is going to shrink down. We're going to start by registering our animator, Twitter header. We're going to have our constructor create a cubic Bezier timing function for us to use. This clamp function is just a little min-max clamping function that's used internally. And then our animate is the process we're going to call with current time and effects. We're going to set scroll to the current time. This is between 0 and 1. This is the timeline we're working on for the animation. And then our first effect, we're going to set its local time, which is where along its transition path, or its animation path, we are, to just whatever the timeline is for our scroll. The second one, we're going to make it a little bit more interesting and use that timing function. Now, animation works a little bit differently. We want to be able to reuse the same animation with multiple different elements. So instead of hard coding them into the animation worklet, we create this generic animation worklet. And then off of its loading, to create a new worklet animation. And this new worklet animation is the thing that's actually going to control how things move around. So the first argument is an array of effects that we want. These come from the animation API uh, that's previously been defined. So a keyframe effect, the first item is what we're actually going to do. So our avatar is our first keyframe effect. We want it to scale from 1 to 0.5. And we want basically each duration to be a single frame, because we're attaching the duration to our scroll. The second one's going to be our header, opacity 0 to 0.8. And we want that same duration. Now, the next part is the cool part. It's the scroll timeline. This is what we're actually listening to to control the timeline. We want to listen on the scrolling container. We want the time range to go from 1, 
have no offset, and we want to go until we've reached the full height of the header. That's basically the duration of this animation that we want. So it'll look something like this, going back to our previous uh, diagram. The header is our keyframe effect that starts at zero, our avatar is our second keyframe effect, and the scroll bar is our current time. And as the scroll bar goes down, current time increases, the header fades in, and the avatar shrinks. Now, this demo worked until this morning when I updated Canary, and then it broke. So y'all are going to get a low-res video that I pulled off the internet of the last time I gave this talk to explain, to show you how this works. Because like I said, warning. So here we have scrolling. You can see the header start to fade in, and the avatar start to get small as we scroll. As we continue to scroll, it eventually locks in place as we keep scrolling. And we can do it in reverse. And as we do it in reverse, it'll undo based on the scroll position in that scrolling container. So really tying complex animations to scroll position. Cool. The last one, the big one, the Layout API. This one's really complex, and I'm sorry, but the advantage of me explaining this whole thing is you will understand how CSS Grid works at the end, which is awesome because it was a big revelation for me. So what is the CSS Layout API? Well, it's going to let us make our own Tetris effectively. It lets us create our own display properties. It'll let us do things like polyfill that new awesome layout spec that we all love, or because I know you like a masonry layout, we can make a masonry layout without the performance hit of doing so. So there's a lot of terminology in this, and unfortunately, it's not so easy to boil down to make it super duper easy, so I'm going to do my best. The first part that we have at the top is our parent layout. This is the thing that actually gets the display property, so display grid, display flex. Those are, that is the element that has that property. Inside that property, we have constraint space. The constraint space is the space available to actually put elements. So it's effectively the space, uh, the width of that element minus the padding, the border, and the scroll bars. Padding, border, scroll bars, those are our layout edges. So we have our parent layout, our constraint space, and our layout edges. The current layout is the thing we're actually currently laying out. And then this part gets a little bit funky because specs are specs, and specs are a little bit ugly sometimes. The child layout is the layout algorithm for the layout child of the current spec, or the current layout. I'll say that again. The child layout is the layout algorithm for the layout child of the current layout. It's annoying, I'm sorry. Layout child consists of style and information, uh, and we can, from there, generate fragments to actually position things around. Our layout child, like I said, has a style map, which is all of the typed OM styles for this current layout, and the layout next fragment function, which will actually generate a fragment, our fragment being the thing we can actually get position and size information from. So we have inline size and block size. Inline size is the size in parallel to the writing direction. Block size is the size perpendicular to uh, writing direction. We can't change those. Those are set by the browser. But what we can do is we've got that block offset and that inline offset. That we can actually change to move this fragment around. We also have layout edges. We've got inline and block edges. We've got start and padding scroll bar borders. OK, the diagrams are out of the way. Let's actually see this in action. The class for a layout worklet has input properties uh, that come from the parent layout. So display grid uh, and things like the grid template columns, the properties that we want to get from that parent. These are all our input properties. Child, or children input properties are things we want to get from the children. So like uh, grid columns and grid rows from children inside display grid. Those are our input child properties, or child input properties. The child display uh, static will let us decide whether we want to blockify elements or not. It's a little bit weird. Uh, it's not really well explained, so we'll just skip it. But the next two things are important. The next two things are effectively the process functions for our layout. 
The first one is intrinsic sizing. Intrinsic sizes. It's a generator, which means that it's designed to be used asynchronously and run in parallel. And this takes children and a style map, and this will allow us to determine the size of a block that we're laying out. And then there's the actual layout function, which takes the constraint space that the parent layout is sitting in, the children of the parent layout, the style map of the parent layout, the edges of the parent layout, and a break token, which is good for pagination. So let's create a brand new layout. Let's create a layout called Centered Stacked. And what this is going to do is each child of this layout is going to be centered in line, so centered horizontally, and stacked one on top of another, something that's pretty easy to visualize for us. The first thing we'll do is we'll do intrinsic sizing. Now, the intrinsic and extrinsic sizing spec is like super duper heavy math, but it basically can be boiled down to this. We want to understand what the max content size is, which is the largest a block can be without any unused space. So how large it can be with all of its content filling as much, all of its space effectively. And the min content size, which is how small we can make something before content starts to overflow. So the intrinsic size function here calculates that for us and then returns the max content size and the min content size. And we can then use that to position and size our item. Then our layout function. The first thing we want to do is we want to figure out the inline size of our parent layout, which is our constraint space that we're in plus its style map. And then the available inline size is that minus all of the inline edges. So what we're doing here is we're basically constructing what the children's constraint space is from how big the parent is. It's this, like I said, this is a very low-level API. We're going to do the same for block. And then we have the constraint space we can put our children in. So where we can actually lay out our individual blocks in like CSS grid, for instance. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loop over each one of the children and create its fragments using that new constraint space. Then we can start actually positioning stuff. We start at wherever the, the edges uh, start. And then we loop over our fragments, put it one below the next, and center it in line, and then add it to whatever our counter is. Just bloop, 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 let them go down the line. From there, we have our auto block size, which is the full offset of all of our stuff, plus whatever the block end is, so that we can make sure we stick our padding and border and edges back onto the bottom of our parent layout. And then we resolve block size, which is a built-in function that lets us actually uh, calculate this all. And we return our inline size for our parent, our block size for our parent, and all of our children. And this actually uh, is the thing that does paint and layout, or layout, I should say, for our custom layout. This is the thing that sizes everything. And what we get is we get something like this. So we have our parent layout, which has display layout center stacked on it. Inside, we have constraint spaces minus the edges. And then each fragment, we align centered uh, and one on top of another. And if this worked, if this was a live spec, it would look something like this. This is effectively just stacking stuff with centering. But this is what this layout would look like if Layout API was live right now. Speaking of if Layout API was live, it kind of is. Are you ready for some cool fireworky stuff? Yeah. Well, uh, Ian Kilpatrick, who is a software engineer on Blink working on Houdini, literally last week got the first implementation of Layout API working. And he built a masonry layout using Layout API. So, here we have a masonry layout. Masonry layout. He is just adjusting the width as normal. But what you can do now is he's going to add padding, and this will control spacing in between each one of those elements in that masonry layout. 
He's then going to add another property called columns, which you can control how many columns you want in this masonry layout. And he's just kind of messing around here. But all of this is done at render engine speed through CSS, so we don't need to have two megabytes of jQuery on our page to do masonry anymore. It's just kind of a CSS layout that we can then, again, control with CSS. And I think that's really cool. So, can't use it today, but the future for Houdini is really bright, and you should be excited about it, because once it starts to land, you're going to be able to do your own magic tricks as well, um, as long as you don't reveal any of your secrets and get thrown out of, I forget. My Arrested Development joke just fell flat because I forgot it was. It's fine. Thank you.